Driven. Hello everyone, this is Data Driven Chat and today we have Brianna Brownell with us. Um, and Brianna is a founder and CEO at Pure Strategy Incorporated. Hello Brianna, it's really nice to Hello. see you, to meet you. <laughs> Wonderful to see you and meet you as well. Uh, thanks a lot for doing this. I know you're very busy and it's challenging to find the time right now, but thank you so much for coming on this podcast and uh, sharing your ideas with us. You're very welcome. Um, so to kick off our discussion, so my understanding that you work between decision science and data science, and I mean, That's I'm, right. I'm really excited about talking to you because that's kind of what I do as well, but I do Ooh, it kind yeah. of on the academic it. side. <laughs> <laughs> and I very rarely meet people like you who do it, you know, on the business side. So I'm really, really excited. So, um, can you tell uh, tell us how did you become interested in this area and uh, tell us a little bit about your personal journey? So wh where did you start? Yeah, how did absolutely. you get into this combination <laughs> of data science and decision science? Um, so when I went to a university, I actually wanted to be a theoretical physicist. And so I was really interested in physics all throughout high school. I love Stephen Hawking. I was so fascinated by quarks. I, you know, just really loved particle physics. Um, but when I got into university, I found out how much I really loved mathematics. So it was the mathematical courses that really pulled me in and made me excited about some of the possibilities around mathematics. And so at that time, um, you know, mathematics was extremely unpopular. Um, and so I graduated, I was the only person who graduated with a degree in math mm -hmm. in the year that I did. Oh, Nobody could understand why the heck I wanted to major in something that was so impractical and so, you know, bizarre. Uh, but my first job uh, right after my undergraduate degree was in finance. So I got a job as a prop trader on the NYSE in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and I absolutely loved it. It was such a fascinating experience to be working in finance at that time. Uh, but of course, you probably know what uh, happened next. The global financial crisis happened yes. next. Um, so everything started to down about uh, 2007. Uh, and so I left uh, the finance industry at that time. Um, but what it really stuck with me was that I could see how human behavior was really um, an important part, a crucial part of some of the mathematical models that I had been creating. And so I started to get really interested in that human behavior side. And so I started working as a, a data analyst. Um, they, you know, we didn't call ourselves data scientists then because they, you know, the term hadn't been created yet. Um, and working with different companies on some of their um, challenges to do with data, doing things like prediction, understanding consumer behavior, um, and understanding some of the uh, sort of deep aspects of, you know, why people make the decisions that they do. And so, you know, after a few years, companies started being really, really interested in using their data more effectively. And so I couldn't have found myself in a better place because data science was, you know, growing in popularity. And all of a sudden, people understood what the heck I was doing. So I felt a little bit, you know, vindicated that um, finally, after so many years of people not understanding why in the heck I wanted to uh, work with mathematical models and work with data, mm -hmm. um, people started coming around to it finally. And so I love that now there's so much interest in data science. Yeah, you probably could say, oh, how little did they know telling me that, you know, you know, mathematics is not interesting. So yeah, <laughs> now yeah. it's and the hottest. People tell me that all the time. <laughs> yeah, now this is the hottest, the hottest field. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so for those people who do not know your work, uh, if you had to pick like one most important thing you have achieved uh, during your career, what would, what, would, what would you pick? What would it be? You know, yeah, that's a great question. One of the things that I'm most proud of is the work that I did um, in Australia with um, the, the Australian government to understand decision-making 
and technology adoption um, by primary producers. Mm -hmm. So in um, 2007, there was a very severe drought in Australia and it was absolutely devastating. Um, a lot of people, you know, lost their homes. It was, you know, ex extremely, extremely, um, you know, dire situation. And um, so what we did was we looked at um, why people were um, adopting technology in order to mitigate their risks due to climate variation. And um, so this research lasted for, um, you know, probably about five, five or eight years. I started in 2007 and, you know, we're still publishing in, I think, you know, 2012, 2013. Um, and it was just absolutely fascinating because it really linked the work that I was doing with data um, to people's lives. So it, instead of being just a bunch of numbers in a spreadsheet or, you know, an algorithm that I ran, it was something that really mattered and it was really impactful. And so I loved working uh, with, the, we had a great research team that I, that I worked with. I was so lucky to, to work with them. And um, it really taught me a lot about how data could be used for um, really improving the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I think I think that I'll kind of uh, I, I can see a lot of similarities with kind of me. I also you know uh, was uh, kind of a lab scientist and then uh, yeah. finally got a job in engineering department uh, just just because I wanted to see my models actually work in the real world. So I think this is a very important. Oh, it's so satisfying, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more what? Uh, about what what are you currently working on? What keeps you awake at night? What you know? What excites you? Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Um, so when you know, so I'd mentioned the work that I did in Australia. One of the big components to that was um, creating typologies to understand how different individuals make decisions in similar ways. And so essentially, we found different groupings of individuals who sort of had the same worldview, had the same attitudes and beliefs. And um, by understanding those attitudes and, and beliefs, we could predict behavior and we could intervene and sort of encourage behavior that um, we wanted to encourage. So for example, mitigating risk um, as a result of climate variation was something that you know we wanted to do because we wanted people to um, you know, have uh, their livelihood be protected. Um, and so now we're using that um, to understand decision making with physicians and patients in the healthcare industry. And I find it really fascinating because, you know, rather than treating um, patients or physicians like some monolithic group that, you know, all does the same thing, you respect the variation and the different worldviews that people have. And so we've done this um, in you know, multiple areas within healthcare um, to understand things like, why is it that patients um, decide not to um, seek care for symptoms that they're experiencing? Um, sometimes they feel um, embarrassed, sometimes they feel um, you know, resigned to some of the symptoms that they're experiencing. Um, you know, and we want to encourage people to um, lead the healthiest lives that they can. Um, so understanding why they may not choose to seek care is extremely important. Um, and then looking down the line, we also see um, individuals when they have a treatment plan, for example, for a condition, um, they may not, um, they may not um, sort of maintain their treatment um, on that plan, they may sort of fall off. They, they uh, you know, don't take their medication at the right time or they, you know, don't schedule follow-up appointments or appointments with other, um, you know, healthcare professionals that they need to see. Um, and so by understanding the behavior and the, the core attitudes and emotions around um, decision-making within the patient group, we can plan interventions and we can say, okay, you know, we um, can encourage certain people to sort of seek a different type of care um, or, you know, be a part of sort of a different kind of program in that way. And so 
especially when we're finding out how challenging um, you know, healthcare can be around the world with COVID-19 um, and all of the different factors that, that uh, feed into people's decision making on how to keep their health to the top you know, shape that it can be, uh, I think it's just really, really important to be able to um, understand those behaviors and those motivations. Yeah, certainly. We will uh, come back to the topic of uh, COVID-19 a bit later. But yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, first, I want to ask you, um, you know, so a lot of people who listen to this pod podcast are aspiring data scientists and they're trying to find a place mm -hmm. in data science. Um, so uh, can you give some tips uh, to people who want to get into this kind of uh, liaison between decision science and data science? Like, where do they start? What do they need to do? Um, yeah, what would be your yeah, advice? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that the the under um, appreciated skill in data science is that um, communication and business acumen. Um, so having the technical skills to run the models and and you know be able to do sort of those technical things like programming in Python and you know understanding databases and that kind of thing, all of those things are really important, but the truth is when you're working in industry, it's all about how that analysis can impact the metrics that the business cares about. So if you are not able to link what you're doing to a goal that the business has or an outcome that's really important, it's really, really hard to get you know, resources and, and to get um, you, basically, it's difficult to be effective if you know the, you're doing something that is not a high priority within the business. And so, this is where I see data scientists really struggling mm -hmm. in an organization when you do modeling with data that isn't linked to any kind of outcome. Um, these teams often get sort of pushed to the side, or they get kind of minimized within the organization. And it's so sad because data science is so impactful and can be so impactful um, that focusing on how what you're doing impacts business metrics is, I think, the best thing that you can do. So technical skills, extremely important, but being able to communicate the value of that to the business is even more important. Yeah, so certainly. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, that that. that I guess the what what is also important is the problem problem statements, right? How, how do you how do you uh, support yes. uh, a, a kind of answering important questions for business? That's uh, uh, that's another thing that probably everybody needs to be able to do as an aspiring data scientist and learn how to do as, a, as an aspiring yes, data scientist. Um, and that brings me to another question, is uh, which is about kind of how do we approach, think about data and approach data in the business context. Um, why do you think understanding data is particularly important uh, for businesses now? And how did data change the business landscape in the last few years? Or did it change? Do you observe the change or did, do you think it's still kind of... It, it, the potential of data is still not realized in the sense that we um, see some. <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so I do think that the potential of data is not realized in most organizations. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, uh, several reasons for this. Uh, the first one is um, siloed data within organizations. So often you'll have um, multiple teams. So I've worked with organizations where they had multiple teams that were essentially collecting the same information. Um, but because of political reasons within the organization, um, they were unwilling to share that data back and forth across departments. Um, I think that's really dangerous because that's a sign of a poorly functioning organization if you know, there's no way to share data across different groups in the organization. Um, so that's always a challenge. Um, individuals often don't know what's possible with data, especially when you get to the C-suite and, and the executive level. Because all of these techniques are so new, it's difficult to know exactly what the, the payoff might be in doing a larger scale analysis project within the organization. 
um, and sometimes the project essentially is a failure. Um, and sometimes you can't get additional insight, but you don't necessarily know until you try. And so that's sometimes a, a real barrier when executives want to see, you know, a certain ROI on their, you know, data programs. Um, but I think that the biggest change in how data is used in organizations is that before, I would say 10 years ago, it was rare to have a data project um, make it all the way up to the C-suite or the board level. Um, so the executives would never actually see any results of a data analytics uh, project. Mm -hmm. They would be within um, the marketing group. They might be within the IT group. They, you know, might be within the sales group. And so they would be sort of kept within those small silos and they would never make it up to the executive level in the organization. But after people started seeing the value of it, we started seeing buy-in at the highest levels of the organization. So not only were executives asking for better data, better analytics, better modeling, but boards of directors were asking for it. Mm -hmm. um, you saw board mandates saying, you know, we need to have some kind of uh, a data um, metric, a data-driven metric um, at, you know, for each, um, you know, quarter, we need to see this metric. We need to, um, and all of this information went to the highest levels of the organization. And that, I think, uh, was a really new thing because before it was, you know, there are a lot of financial metrics, for example, the accounting metrics. So, you know, any, any you know, operations and, and finance area, all of that was always reported to the, the board and the executive. But now um, the marketing metrics, the, you know, operations um, research metrics, the, you know, all of these areas are finding themselves in the boardroom. And I think that that's a really positive sign. Yeah, definitely. But uh, also at the same time, I kind of want to challenge a little bit uh, what you say, what you said. But also at the same time, I feel I don't know whether you feel uh, the same way. Um, so I feel that there is at the same time quite um, kind of lack of understanding in you know in the board about like that you know data science is not a kind of magic wand that you solve the yes. problems with. Yes, yes, <laughs> like, yes exactly. So if you don't <laughs> if you don't have high quality data, like there's not much you could. Maybe the insights are not as valuable. And also, I think there is definitely like I feel. I don't know if you share that opinion. I'd be curious to find out what you think about it. Uh, like I feel that there is often lack of understanding of methodology. Like people would yeah. like look at you know insignificant results or you yeah. know look at uh, too few uh, uh, too, too few data points to be able to make a decision yeah. so i guess mm -hmm. um, i guess in that sense people like you who come in and explain you know <laughs> that that's probably yeah. not a good idea you need to look here <laughs> instead mm -hmm. to have a, mm -hmm. a proper decision intelligence and decision insight um Using data, I think it's 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 critical. So, do you feel that there is this kind of? Uh, on the one hand, yeah, it's great yes. that there is data, but it's just too much hype about you know what data can do. Uh, You're absolutely right. Um, I think that it's interesting because um, a lot of times I've seen there's usually a one or two people on uh, the board or the executive team that really understand data well. And um, if you have that person as sort of the champion for the analytics projects that you're doing, it, you know, it really, really helps. Now, there's absolutely cases where people misunderstand the data. They, uh, the data it's based on is, you know, is, is not clean, for example, or, you know, has, has some kind of a bias into, in it. Um, and, you know, and that's always a challenge because you can uh, make decisions on data that isn't, you know, necessarily um, as sort of strong as you think it is. And so the where I see that changing is that there's a lot of interest as um, for organizations to train people as sort of citizen data scientists. So, 
you know, you, um, you can be in any role in the organization, and then you also augment your skills with um, a better understanding of data and how it pertains to your role. And so I see that more and more where, you know, large organizations are um, providing training, providing, um, you know, getting consultants to sort of lead work groups around um, how data is used and how it's understood uh, within the organization. So I'm hopeful that, you know, the challenges that you mentioned, which are absolutely true challenges, um, are starting to get better and better. So I'm hoping within 10 years, we're going to be kind of out of the woods on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I also hope so. And yeah, like you mentioned that it's uh, it's uh, it's cool when you have a person who can translate, you know, <laughs> insights, maybe more sophisticated data insights for the board. Like we recently were working with a, like a big corporate a client and they um uh, we had a person who had the phd in physics and uh, he this guy is amazing i mean he can turn any piece of sophisticated analysis into bar charts like we produced all this like you know mappings and graphs yeah. and all, all that and he turned all of it into like very very simple bar charts and presented that to the board yeah. but that was awesome i was i was thinking wow like you can actually do you know all of this just in in such a simple way I want yeah. to ask you several questions about um, women in STEM. Yeah, and, for sure. And um, because you know you are you are CEO yourself, and uh, you're in a very high tech, I guess, male dominated environment. Uh, so, in your opinion, do we have a lack of female CEOs? It's, I mean, I know it's it's not a it's not a trick question, but a few people <laughs> challenged that on this podcast yeah, yeah. because you know sometimes they say, oh, it depends on you know the sector. So I just want to say, do you do you think that we have a problem? And if so, uh, why do we have this problem? What what do you, do you think are the underlying reasons for that? So I do think that I wish that there were more women CEOs leading um, deep tech and, and, and high tech companies, um, because first of all, I just think it's a fascinating area and I think it's so important and it allows people to be shapers of the future instead of just being sort of um, impacted by the technology that comes along to be able to be part of the group who is actually changing the future and who is actually creating it. Um, as far as why I think um, there was, so why I think uh, there are fewer women um, that are doing these kinds of things, one of the most important things I think is visibility for women. Um, and young girls to see that it's a viable career path for them. Because I think that there are so many women that I know who just happen to uh, become lawyers or veterinarians or you know um, other sort of similar prof professions. And the only reason that they didn't go into tech, for example, isn't that they you know weren't good at it or anything. It was just because they didn't know that they could. Mm -hmm. They just they didn't know anyone who was an engineer or a computer scientist or who worked in that area, and they didn't realize it was an option for them. And so, by seeing people who are doing interesting things and being exposed to it, I think is extremely important. Um, and being able to see people who are sort of like them in some of these roles. So. I'll never forget um, Gwyn Shotwell, um, who's you know such an amazing person, um, engineer, COO of SpaceX. One of the things that she said was the reason that she became an engineer was that a female engineer had come to speak at her school and she was wearing a really amazing suit. <laughs> So that sounds that sounds really silly because it sounds like, oh, well, why is it so important to, you know, what she was wearing? But what it reveals is that, you know, this girl wanted to see herself in that role, in that profession. So mm -hmm. it wasn't the suit. It was that does um, this 
individual allow me to sort of see myself in this role? Can I see myself as an engineer? What would it be like if I were an, an engineer or you know a data scientist or a technologist? And I think that that's extremely, extremely important. Yeah, I like how you talk about kind of, uh, you know, we often talk about role models, but you talk about kind of this um, role models uh, as... Um, you know, in 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 a sense, you know, you don't you don't necessarily need a specific person. You just, you know, you can have someone who comes in a cool suit and that kind of inspires yeah. you. You know, yeah. actually, I want that, right? Or I want to be in space. Exactly. <laughs> or I want to, yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, yeah, just just uh, just work with this group of people or something like that, just like this woman. Yeah. So and, and then that that type Absolutely. of type of example is cool. I want to kind of zoom out a little bit on this uh, diversity and inclusivity uh, to kind of talk about more than more than just women, right? Because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like even even mm -hmm. if we just to take the f the females um, i mean if we look at fortune 500 and we, we just recently did this with uh, one of my students and uh, some some of my colleagues and um, we actually <laughs> found out that uh, if we look at you know women representation in fortune 500 is not great right but still like it's better than it used to be but if we look at, for example, if we start looking at minorities, then the situation is just really bad. Like, for example, if we look for women of color, there are just three of them in Fortune 500 and yeah. none of them are black, for example. You know, it's just uh, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like there is the, the, the system is broken somewhere. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering, you know, in general, what can we do to increase diversity and inclusivity in, in tech? In, in tech industries, not just focusing maybe on women, but just a broader, like if, if we could look at a kind of broader picture of what we can do. I think that it's about um, creating an environment where people know that they belong and feel that they belong. Mm -hmm. um, so I had mentioned that people need to be able to see themselves in those roles. Um, so being able to see someone like you in a senior role and realize that that's a possible career path for you, I think that that's really important because when you don't see anyone like you, it's easy to feel that you don't belong, mm -hmm. right? And so everyone, every human has a need to belong and be a part of a community and you know, be a part of a group that all you know it has that sense of community around it. And so, being able to create those groups, I think, is so 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 important. So, um, I'm seeing more and more online um, support groups or groups where people can gather and sort of share their experiences, share their stories, share advice. Um, and I, I think that that's a really positive sign to be able to create these groups where you feel like you can be yourself, that you belong there, that people aren't going to judge you or think that you're strange for having the interest that you do. And so um, to me anyway, this is a, a really important part of a much bigger and really challenging picture. Uh, so as many of my students are executive students and uh, they, uh, you know, are constantly worried about um, uh, technical skills that they need. Yep. So you, you mentioned that you, so you are come, you, you came from a technical background um, and you are CEO and, uh, but, you know, in terms of the technical skills that you need um, in order to kind of lead uh, in, in the current conditions. Do you think that it's, it's mm -hmm. important to know how to code? It's important to understand how, I don't know, um, algorithms work. Like what level of technical uh, ability do you need as a leader today? Not, not only as a female leader, but, you yeah, know, I, yeah. just, just, I just want to ask in general, um, you know, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. your gender is, uh, whatever the, yeah, you know, yeah. the group you represent, um, uh, in, in terms of, you know, what, what, skills, what skills are important for leadership today in, mm -hmm. in your view? So if you're um, leading a technology company, it's much, much easier to find um, excellent talent if the at the top levels of the organization, you have someone with um, 
great technical skills. And the reason for that is a lot of technical folks, um, when they first start out in their career, almost all of us have the experience of working for a non-technical leader who didn't, under, didn't understand really um, what we were doing, um, marginalized it, um, had unrealistic expectations, um, you know, was basically very difficult to uh, work for. Um, and so when you're a technical person, you want to work for someone who understands some of those um, issues and someone who will advocate for you as a, a you know, contributor to an important part of the company and not marginalize the sort of um, development and the, and the technical um, prowess that it takes to make a company succeed. And so it's not critical for um, the CEO, for example, to be, you know, a, a programmer or, you know, to, to know how to code. Um, but you either need to have a good enough understanding of how um, software architecture works that you can respect um, the, the opinions and the knowledge level that's in within your technical team, um, or you need to partner with someone who does have that knowledge and who can sort of um, advocate for uh, the technical team in a way that's respectful to um, their skill set. And so um, I find that one of the challenges that um, women leaders often face is that they'll be um, a non-technical CEO or mm -hmm. non-technical founder um, and are sort of invariably looking for a technical co-founder, right? Um, and that relationship can absolutely work as long as the co-founder um, who is leading the technical side is um, has enough sort of respect from the original founder um, to be able to um, create something that is, um, you know, works for the business. So mm -hmm. instead of being just, oh, I have this idea, can you just code it for me, <laughs> yeah. right? And because that just never works, right? That It just doesn't work doesn't to, work, have, yeah. to bring someone on to just, um, you know, um, code to code something you know, the, the respect for the technical skills and um, the, the technical needs of the, the company needs to be in there. Yeah, uh, I, I just wonder, you were t t talking about it uh, and about like horrible bosses, you know, <laughs> I just remembered I once worked for a person who asked me to re regress a variable on itself. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> to get uh -huh. the perfect correlation and I was like are you sure about yeah. this <laughs> yeah but yeah. but but yeah I mean the lack of uh, yeah the lack of understanding is is a big is a big problem and yeah uh, I completely yeah I completely hear you when you're saying that you know attracting talent would be a lot easier if you had uh, mm -hmm. and also and also had the reputation like you said if you are all model yourself I guess um, coming back to your point about role models, you know, if if people know that you have reputation in 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 the, in the tech industry, I guess that you can definitely attract people that you yeah, know would definitely. Um, it would be good. Um, so you you already touched on. I mean, we cannot avoid. Um, the topic of coronavirus, it, it's affecting <laughs> yeah. everything. And you already yeah. mentioned the amazing work that you are doing in uh, kind of in the medical in, in, in the medical industry for med folks. So, but I just want to kind of ask you a little bit more general question about the role of data science in solving the current crisis because you know there is a lot of speculation like some people <laughs> say that oh data scientists should only get involved when there is like a, a field expert you know working with them yep, yep. and other uh, and other people say you know, we all should be doing like work on COVID and just see what happens. Yeah. So, yeah. so which spectrum, on which side of the spectrum are you at? Like, what do you think about this? I think it's really interesting because a lot of the really successful um, applications of data science and AI within, um, you know, fighting coronavirus have all been 
um, human augmentation systems mm -hmm. or very sort of human centered systems that um, are being helped along by good data science and good AI. So an example of that would be some of the triage applications. So being able to um, analyze a chest X-ray, for example, and predict whether that person is at risk for complications or for um, serious effects um, yeah, as yeah. a result high, high of, group. of yeah yeah mm -hmm. um, instead of having um, doctors or other healthcare professionals radiologists for example uh, look at all of the images and and do it kind of in a slower way so you have a system that can augment and make the job of the physician and the radiologist and the, the healthcare professionals that are working at the hospital easier and empower them to provide the best care that they can and empower them to provide to basically have the best kind of outcomes that we can. Um, so that I think is, is really interesting and important. Um, emerging patterns has been really interesting. So when we originally saw the blip of Hey, this might be something way back in, you know, I think it was January or December. Um, all of the early warning systems that surfaced it um, went to sort of a group of human experts mm -hmm. who then dug deeper into it to see what the, the real risk was. And what was interesting about that is the humans who were looking into this were, you know, experts, professionals in, um, um, in, in infectious disease, and they recognized that there was a real, um, you know, a real potential for big impact. Um, so I love the idea of the um, data science and AI systems um, being used as human augmentation systems. So it's not you know, AI is going to save the day. Mm -hmm. It's how can we use AI and data science to make humans better, make, you know, make us more effective and empower us to have better health outcomes rather than having it say, oh, we have this tech system and we're going to replace you. I, I think that COVID-19 has really proven that AI and, and, you know, analytics is not going to replace people, it's going to augment them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of brings us to uh, um, uh, uh, even, um, uh, even kind of more zoomed out question of, you know, what challenges do you think the um, kind of, uh, yeah, this in intersection between decision science and data science is facing today? Like, uh, are there any new challenges that we actually saw with COVID yeah. or are there maybe there, some problems that were there and that were all of a sudden highlighted by the current yeah. situation? The biggest problem that we found uh, was the brittleness of all of our systems. So if you look at all of the huge industry-wide system failures that happened due to COVID-19, they're all because of that um, brittleness of the system. So you have um, hospitals with no surge capacity or no equipment, right? Because hospitals are run to operate the most efficiently as they possibly can. And so why have extra? Extra is, you know, doesn't make you money. It makes you lose money, right? Mm -hmm. um, supply chain systems, you know, you see all of these, um, when all of the restaurants closed and people started shopping in a completely different way, mm -hmm. you had huge shortages in, in things like yeast. Like, I don't think I can still buy yeast <laughs> at the grocery store, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. Um, because consumer behavior was changing. Um, the buyers were changing. All of a sudden, restaurants just weren't buying any more food. Mm -hmm. um, people's um, habits on what they were eating completely changed. Um, and so I think that it really exposed how brittle some of our optimization can be to tiny little changes. So I remember uh, reading that one of the, um, there was one farmer who was um, producing onions for restaurants and, you know, large scale uh, production. And wasn't able to sell it directly to consumers because um, they were being put in these like enormous bags mm -hmm. and they didn't have a system in place to be able to 
you know, put it in a, you know, a Small bag that's the size that, a, a, you know, a household would uh, be able to use. And so it's really exposed how, um, you know, we did a great job in optimizing our supply chains and, you know, making everything as efficient and, and perfect as possible. But one little movement and all of a sudden those systems completely break down. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that what uh, COVID-19 has really taught us about how we build our systems is that we didn't do a very good job of building resiliency into a lot of the, the really important things, uh, the really important industries that we need to. So, you know, supply chain for food, of course, is, is one. Um, healthcare is another one. Um, think about education systems, how all of a sudden teachers and parents are scrambling to try to um, teach their children when they're at home and everybody, you know, everybody is trying to work from home and all of these systems. Um, IT systems for um, allowing the IT infrastructure to allow workers to work from home. There are all of these systems that we've created that are super brittle to any kind of change. And so I'm hoping that in the future, resiliency is going to be seen as a good thing to, to build in, into these systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so how about this future? Like, where do you see, like, apart from, you know, building resiliency in, in supply chain, do you see any other important hot topics <laughs> for, 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 for data science and, uh, yeah, and the intersection between decision science and data science in, in the future? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that the changes in consumer behavior, the changes in the way that we live our lives, this has been a a permanent change in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we we shouldn't be looking back to, you know, when are we going to get back to normal? Because it's going to be a new normal. It's going to be the next normal. Um, and it's going to be very different from the, the world that we lived in pre-COVID. Um, things like working from home are going to become very common. There are already huge companies that are saying that we're going to have a permanent work from home policy. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to have a huge impact on uh, rural areas or uh, places outside major centers because all of a sudden, um, you can if you can work from anywhere that has a great broadband connection, mm -hmm. then um, you know you can um, stimulate the economy with jobs, even if it's not um, you know a physical office in there. Mm -hmm. um, travel, especially air travel, is going to be fundamentally fundamentally different. Um, I think that we are going to stop having large airports. Large airports are going to um, basically become a thing of the past. We're going to have multiple small airports mm -hmm. because imagine how much safer you would feel if um, a small airport was completely sanitized yeah, and you weren't yeah. at risk um, with, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of passengers in a large airport. Um, and so I think that a lot of the trends that have come as a result of COVID-19 are here to stay. And so we're going to have a rocky uh, next couple of years where um, we adjust to the next normal. Mm -hmm. And data and analytics is going to be a, an important part of that um, because then we're going to be able to see uh, what the changes really are mm -hmm. um, and which changes are becoming permanent. So um, I'm encouraging everybody um, if you have data about your organization um, pre COVID, you really have to check mm -hmm. <laughs> that your assumptions are still valid. Um, any decision that you made off of that data, you need to really think about whether it still applies. Yeah, and I, I really like your point about how you know that you know the data propagates through the entire supply chain systems, and you know the, in a sense. We didn't, I think many people did not realize that. They didn't realize how much, you know, um, you know, analyzing today's demand actually uh, has impact on, you know, the decisions about supply. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Yeah, For sure. and how, you know, this volatility is uh, under normal circumstances, they're fine. But if something like this happens, right, then, then you have, you, you, your business can completely collapse because you are not, 
yeah, you're not you're not prepared. You're not you're not prepared to understand that you know the, the shocks in 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 demand are probably not permanent, and you you know you just mm-hmm. are not very um, yeah not very resilient resilient like you said. So we're almost at the end of the interview, and I just have one last question. It's a traditional question that every everybody complains about. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so here's the question: If I asked you to recommend one book and one film, what would you choose? What would be your recommendations? <laughs> so the best book about artificial intelligence, in my opinion, is Machines Who Think mm-hmm. by Pamela McCordick. So this book was written um, several decades ago, I think 40 years ago or something, um, right when AI was starting to um, generate more and more interest. And it is absolutely one of the most fascinating books about the topic because she marries some of the humanities and some of the um, other fields like art, for example, um, literature, who uh, to the topic of AI and looks at it in a much more holistic way than any other sort of technical AI book. So that is a hundred percent, um, you know, one you should check out. She also has a biography that just came out that Mm. I absolutely loved. I just like (laughs) went through it in, in, you know, like read it start to finish, even though it was like really long because she's had an amazing life. Um, but yes, so I would say that one is absolutely, um, number one on my list. Mm -hmm. Um, so for, uh, can I pick a TV show instead yes, of a movie? Yes, yes. It's a popular choice. A lot of people <laughs> pick TV shows. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go with uh, Battlestar Galactica. Uh-huh. So I love BSG, mm-hmm. the new, the reboot, the new one. Okay, okay. Um, and the reason that I love it is because it brings up so many ethical questions about how we're going to deal with sentient AI in the future what the risks are, um, what kinds of um, systems we might have to put in place. And it's just an absolutely fascinating show. So um, definitely my favorite AI related show is Battlestar Galactica. Well, thank you so much, Brianna, for finding the time. I know you're very busy, so but thank you for this. And uh, you know, you're very the, welcome. Thanks a lot, and yeah, good luck with everything, and uh, <laughs> continue so the, all the amazing, amazing work that you are doing. I definitely will keep an eye on on um, what you are up to and Pure Strategy Incorporated, what you guys are up to. And awesome. uh, thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs>